In the tunnel. In the tunnel. In the tunnel. You're listening to In the Tunnel. Welcome to In the Tunnel, episode number 121. Uh-huh. First time that we've done one of these since July. July, like, 5th or 6th, right? It's been... Yeah, 4th of July weekend, something like that. Yeah. Not for lack of trying, we did outline and plan for one, although that admittedly was in August, Um, so we still... <laughs> had like a month um yeah, yeah but i mean we always come back yeah but there's also like a bunch of things that were happening right like i have a new background so my internet didn't work for most of the time we were trying to plan in that month you know yeah but just like cicadas we eventually come back <laughs> yeah so uh let's kick it right off with the mlb playoffs yeah, so last we checked in with MLB on this show, there were a lot more teams in the mix. That has since gone away. Yep. My uh, my Pirates faltered from, like, four games above 500 to back to, like, 10 games under. Yep. So what's happened in a month and a half? Um, I mean, we, like... We have the White Sox, who are, like, generationally bad to the... Like, we were saying generationally bad in the sport, sports world for a long time this season. Yeah. But only now are we looking at it with the eyes of, like, oh, my God, not only is it generally, generationally bad, but, like, record-setting bad, like, worse yeah. since, like, the 1940s. Man, like, I don't know, like... They're gonna go an entire season without with less than a twenty five percent win rate. What's crazy though is the one White Sox game I went to this year. We left in the fifth inning. It was a walk off home run for <laughs> Andrew Benintendi. <laughs> it was like a walk off grand slam. Was like so I did see just by luck, luck, one of like. One of 40 wins or something like that? Not even yet. It's like one of 30. They had like three wins at the time when we went. <laughs> they, and I think they had won the night before, so everybody was... I Okay. Last year, I went to a lot of Pirates games just to get the freebies and then ended up leaving. Yep. So I hopped on White Sox Reddit and... They were doing a hockey jersey giveaway at this game. And I was like, hey, me and my buddies are in town. We're really only showing up to get the jersey. We're going to hang for a few innings. When should we go? The number of comments I got about don't give this team any money. They're so cheap. is like, you do understand I'm a Pirates fan, right? Like, and then... When I went to Seattle this year, and I was like, I want to get Teal Mariners hat, and they're like, the Mariners are actively on Reddit. They're not trying to win. Don't do this to yourself. And I just respond all the time. I'm like, you understand, I'm a Pirates fan. Like, it genuinely could be a lot worse. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, that. the White Sox team is... A different brand of bad, though. Like even it's compared to the Pirates, bad, and they it, it's 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 worse because like there's nothing appealing about like the White Sox as a brand. Yeah, like their colors are black and white. Uh their logo is like a hard graffiti. Yep, it, it's just very hard to be like this rocks. I mean, um, I I did think like the. The stadium was pretty nice, like, in terms of... Stadium's all right. Like, 
everything's fenced in and it's wall to wall advertisement. Uh and I like most stadiums are advertisement, but like the the whole like it it reveres like Yankee Stadium in that like instead of anything that's a semblance of a skyline, it's just like, oh, go to you know, giant grocery store ad, be like, we sell beer, stuff like that. And it's like that from left field all the way to right field. Okay. It's like you do feel like you're kind of like vertically in a cell. Okay. Yeah, I know. A lot of, like when I was there, it's been like 15 years. So don't remember too much. But it, it was fine. When that, we... that team has actually won a World Series more recently than like 95% <laughs> of sports teams. Yeah. It was like 2000. Something yeah, like that. something like that. But anyway, like, okay, let's talk teams that are in the hunt, right? Like, you have the Twins pulling up the rear of the AL, right, mm-hmm. at the moment. Um, the AL, we're looking at the Twins in the sixth spot. Yeah. They're playing the Astros as of right now in the three spot. Um. We have the Orioles in the four, the Royals in the five, and then the Yankees and Guardians at the one and two. Yeah. Um, and, and then in the NL, we have the Mets pulling up the rear by a little bit. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, the Phillies, Dodgers, and Brewers are the current leaders for their divisions. Yeah, so we have Phillies one, Dodgers two. Three Brewers, four Padres, five Diamondbacks. Damn, and uh, like, the Braves are only half a game back as of now. I was going to say, it sounded like the Braves were in that wild card spot firm for a while, and the Diamondbacks kind of got hot. Mm-hmm. Also, like, again, I know I've said this before in previous episodes, like, the fact that the Padres actually got rid of guys and became the version that we all thought that they were going to be when they first handed out 150 to Bogarts and 300 to Tatis and Machado. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, they they spent big league money, even though they're not a big league city. And I don't know. Yeah. But I mean, like... I think it got past the point of, like, actively rooting for them. But I mean, like... Um, at least we still have some race with like what 10, 15 games left in the season with the Braves only being half game out of a spot. Uh, like, cause if you look at the AL, your next team is the Tigers and they're three games out. Like, don't look so hot. Well, it's the AL, but yeah. So, I mean, I really think the AL is kind of like more set in stone, as in those are probably going to be the six teams like i really don't see the tigers or the mariners or the red sox for that matter taking the last spot i was just curious because they're in the same division if the twins played the tigers the rest of the way but it looks like they do not yeah so that that helps because like if they played each other and the tigers swept then like they would by far be the worst record team in the playoffs. Yep. Like, we we did go from, in the span of a month and a half, and we kind of knew this to some extent, the NL went from more volatile and everybody was kind of, like, hovering around 500 to now teams are, like, 13, 14 games over. Yeah. And now the AL is the one where it's, like, yeah, the Twins are in sixth place with nine games over 500, but the next team is only, like, three games over 500. Right. So, like, we, we kind of shifted landscapes in terms of, like, which has the most to gain and the less to lose. Yep. Um. Yeah, but, like, I mean, at least in the AL, right? Yankees, Yankees Cleveland, and Houston are pretty set in stone um yeah. um 
I think at some point we have to ask at what point is it Houston's last run? Because like Altuve is mid thirties. Bregman went from perennial all star to we don't really talk about him much anymore. And their wave of big prospects has kind of come and gone. Mm-hmm. Yep. So I mean, Jose Abreu didn't work at first base. He's no longer in the picture. Um, nope. They, they're winning, but it, it's pretty much squarely on good pitching at this point. And yeah. you'd have to think that whatever offense they're contributing to the equation is not going to hold for much longer. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Let's Fair. look at the team batting average. Um, I mean, like, uh, they they score, at least, right? They're, like, I don't know. Actually, they, they're 262, which is the second in baseball. Yeah. The team. Padres are 265. I don't know. Like it just feels like their roster older, right? Let's see. Let's check game day. Well, two base bank three or two. Jordan Alvarez three ten. They did go get Yandy Diaz a three or two. All right, I stand corrected. They're doing fine. Mm-hmm. But, uh, here and now I say on air, <laughs> I'm very wrong. They have one hitter in their lineup that's batting under 250. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, corrected. yeah. That, I mean, according to like, you know, run differential, they're scoring a good amount more. So it would make sense. Oh, well, then maybe they reloaded at just the right time. Maybe. I, I, I have no patience for them to keep winning, though. Um, I've always looked at a team like the Twins and rooted for them, Mm -hmm. but they just have such bad luck in the playoffs. It's like everything that they do in 162 games, it just falls right apart as soon as October hits. I don't know what it is, but they just... A few years ago, it was like, oh, the pitcher who used to like drive Uber, stuff like that is like, Nothing that they do between April and September ever means anything. I think that their best playoff moment was that game 163 that was, like, in 2008. Okay. They they fought all the way back and then, yeah. like, climbed into it. Yeah. I, I'd say that's pretty fair. I mean, I think most of the teams that are shooing for the playoffs are pretty good. Um... It'll be good to see some of the matchups. Uh, well, again, obviously rooting for the Yankees, but who else is there that actively is there to root for? I mean, I don't know. I, you know, I root for the Yankees, so <laughs> I'm not going to root for the the other New York team. I mean, at least, I, I do think that the Royals right now, if they enter the picture, huh. um have the best chance of but it's hard because they also won in 2015 or 16 yeah like, no but like okay like if, if those small market teams that that fall all the way apart and then have to rebuild all the way back up you always have to have a little bit of a soft spot for them yeah but like i don't know like you know as a yankees fan i'm probably not going to root for another team in the al so like if i'm looking at another team i'm looking at like probably like padres or something my mindset has always been in sports like it's not going to be the team that beats my team but if there's somebody who takes a different path regardless of conference like in the nfl which we'll jump into in a second is like the detroit lions will never the, as you said, in in the way of the Steelers getting to a Super Bowl, mm-hmm. but just knowing what they've gone through, you uh, and now how gritty they play, you always 
at least in my world, have such a high respect for them that you can't root for them losing. Mm -hmm. uh, not to mention, like, a lot of the players on the team are castaways. Um, but in baseball, like, I, I do sympathize with small market teams. Yeah. And even, like, I know it's out of out of context, but, like, if you understand even big market teams that just historically have such horrible stories about, like, choking in the late uh, regular season or, like, getting there or having bad injury luck, like, I, I sympathize with Mets fans because how many times did they think, okay, we have DeGrom and Syndergaard, and then think, like, they were yeah like, maybe one piece away from a World Series, and then, like, within a month, it was just DeGrom and Syndergaard are both on the shelf. So, like, I, I sympathize with those fan bases and teams because, like, they they never seem to have it all go right. And, like, True. when they get within your shot of having a chance, you, you're kind of like, kind of like a kid who, like, can't swim. You're kind of like, I mean, all right, I'll, you know, like, I, I want to see you get there. I, as much as, like, I, I'm probably never rooting for the Mets. <laughs> and that's fine. We, you know, we have a different point of view on things, though. Like, you've seen a handful of Yankees rings, and you've seen one of those rings against the Mets. The Mets are obviously a rival to the Yankees. But for me, like, if the Phillies went eight years with sub-500, and they didn't have a bunch of $300 million contracts on this on their team... And they built up through prospects mm -hmm. and knowing that they basically had a full rebuild. I won't go out and buy Philly's merch, but hmm. fair. It would be That's easier fair. to root for them. That's like fair. Tampa Bay, the Rays, the problem with the Rays, like in 2020, we were all very happy just to have a World Series. But the Dodgers, they're like the the typical team of like they obviously are going to go for it every year. Yeah. So yeah, why should I feel are. like they why do I feel like they should deserve it more than the Rays? I feel like the Rays, who have like a thirty million dollar payroll, should deserve it more because it, it takes advanced analytics, it takes scouting, it takes basically being perfect in your formula to get there. The problem with the Rays is after 2020, there was a sense of arrogance in those players. The Wander Francos. Yeah. Um, and that they're even when Franco was gone, the rest of the guys, even this year, when I was seeing them in Pittsburgh, like they, they just have a swagger to them, despite the fact that they're like five games under 500. So it, you start to lose your sympathy. Yeah. Because. The, the feel-good story has come and gone. These guys feel like they deserve it. Uh, a feel-good story true. always trumps entitlement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, like, regardless, though, like, oh, well, I'm kind of excited, like, to pick up watching a lot of baseball again during the playoffs. Because the regular season, like, outside the opening few games, it's kind of tough to to sit through a game unless I'm there. So it'll be good to see some baseball again. Yeah, I mean, I, I haven't gone to a game since July. And it's not because of the record, it's just everything yeah. changed. But like... To be fair, know, I haven't gone to a game since July either. Weeks. Yeah, the ones I dragged you to. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, anyway, uh, let's start talking some... Well, I did drag you to the game where the Pirates ran out of fireworks because they hit seven home runs. Yeah, that was too funny. It was, it was... Yeah, everybody, did, like, kind of felt it, too, because even the people around us were like, did they run out? Everybody lost their voice that night. Yeah. 
well, it felt weird. Yep. That was like the last. It's hard to believe that that was this season. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, let's uh, move from the MLB to the NFL now. So why don't we talk some wide receiver contracts? Yeah. So it, it, it just dawned on me right before we started recording that this all kind of stems from one move this season. Yep. At least the Justin Jefferson contract uh-huh. where he got 140 earlier. Yep. And we're now starting like wide receivers have always been considered divas as it were. The thing now is we're reaching NBA level where like the NFL never worked this way historically because obviously there's so many players on the team that one player it trade or don't trade it doesn't make a huge difference Mm -hmm. like having playmakers makes a difference but you'll always have another receiver on the roster yep um and so like guys who are on their rookie deals is like all right we'll we'll trade you we'll get a a high pick for you and we'll keep it moving Mm -hmm. we'll split off our bones you know um but now we're looking at CD Lamb, who got one. Did they both get 120? I think both of them got 120. Okay, so CD Lamb of the Cowboys got 120, and Brandon Ayuk of the 49ers got 120. Um, different guaranteed money. I think Ayuk got more guaranteed. Um, but. We also saw CeeDee Lamb, he kind of, he didn't really hold out, but he didn't do any preseason snaps, anything like that, which was now in a three-game preseason doesn't really mean a ton. Um, Actually, CeeDee Lamb got 4-136. Ayuk got 4-120. Okay. okay, but Ayuk, I think, got more guaranteed, right? Like 65? Yeah, I didn't I didn't check guaranteed. I just checked total. Okay. Okay. Um. So, anyway, um, Lamb didn't kind of, like, didn't stay away from the team. Ayuk did. Ayuk basically was teetering on the fence of being traded here to mm-hmm. the Steelers, um, which I was very much against um, because if a guy – if a wide receiver wants $30 million and you already have a wide receiver one – you should not be trading for a guy who wants thirty million. Mm-hmm. You can get I agree. a second. You could get a wide receiver too for a lot cheaper than thirty. Um, Lamb, I I respect. Kind of did it quietly. I made an absolute media spectacle of it. He stopped showing up uh, to. Uh, and part of it is Steelers fans' part fault for overreacting. Way too hard. But, yep. Um, I, I, I believe, was basically, like, wouldn't show up in team issue, anything, wouldn't wear the team name. Then they'd have negotiations one day, and he'd show up in the shirt. Then, uh, you know, that says 49ers. Then the next day, he would go back to... So he was basically kind of playing mind games throughout this whole thing. I'll, only for, I guess, what happened is the 49ers gave him an ultimatum of like take a deal that we're giving you or just decide to be gone. And then he decided to stay. So it was like, he was never going to go anywhere anyway. Um, yep. Which is fine. You know, like I said, um, it's, as a Steelers fan, I would prefer not to trade for a $30 million wide receiver, especially with, TJ Watt and Minka Fitzpatrick making 30 million themselves. You just got Justin Fields. And if you actually think he's the future, you got to pay him this offseason. So it all leads to like somebody, somebody's going to start a domino effect of getting cut that's going to impact a balance in talent anyway. Yep. So like you bring in more offense and you lose the defense. So it's kind of like, Go get a guy for 10 to 12 mil and just chill there. Um, do we think Ayuk is worth 120 mil? I'm of the opinion that he's not. 
I, I think he's very, very good, but he's in the perfect scenario. He's in a scenario where regularly you have a top five offensive line. You have a quarterback who, at the very least, is a top-level game manager. You have Christian McCaffrey. You have Debo Samuel and George Kittle. You don't have to be a stud Mm. in that offense to be a contributor. Okay. Good for him for getting his money and his guaranteed money. But C.D. Lamb and Justin Jefferson... I think are more deserving of the contract because if you take those guys out of the lineup, you're looking at a shell of the team. And I think if you take Brandon Ayuk out of the lineup, as we kind of saw Monday night, especially for people who play fantasy football and have him, after he signed the deal because he basically held out the whole preseason, they didn't snap. They held him on a very limited snap count anyway, and he had like, two, three catches for 30 yards. So basically a non-factor in the game. They still won by two touchdowns. Yeah. So, and that's against a Jets team that's believed to be at least competent this year. So... We'll see. Well, yes. But the reasoning now is that... I I mean, to the neutral fan, I, I don't know how many people would say that Ayuk is bad. I think most people say Brandon Ayuk is very good. Yeah. I, I do think at the same time, I think that Brandon Ayuk is a guy who gets maybe like an $80 million contract, but I didn't see 120. And I don't understand $30 million a year. I mean, my thing who... is with contracts for major sports, it's like there's so much money going into it anyway, right? And like We've already seen, like, quarterback contracts go up by, like, factors. You're about to start seeing, like, all the rest of the players, like, big-name contracts going up by factors. So, would we say that Debo Samuel or Brandon Ayuk is the better wide receiver? Uh, I don't know. I mean... I understand there are different kinds of receivers. Samuel is more of a Swiss army knife. They get involved in different ways. But he's also proven to be a very capable and consistent receiver. They gave him a three-year, $71 million deal. So if we're not talking guaranteed money, around 23 mil. So they gave 30 million over four years to the other guy who you could argue isn't the better receiver. I mean, I would say that Ayuk, like, he only fills, like, one kind of role. Right. So while he's, like, I wouldn't say one of them is better than the other, but I'd say that his, like, it's easier to replace a singular role than one person who does multiple things. And I agree with that. Um, so if one is worth seventy-one million, I can't, I can't understand and accept. If I'm a Forty ers fan, one hundred twenty, and I know I, I do have a couple Forty ers friends in my social circle, and when I was like the IU rumors to the Steelers, and I was like telling them like. Look, man, as a Steelers fan, I understand he's very good. I don't really want him. It doesn't make sense. In the Arthur Smith system, which, if you're familiar with Tennessee, how they ran their offense with Arthur Smith, is like they had A.J. Brown, and then you couldn't name the next guy, and they still made the playoffs, like, every year. Yeah. Um, so that's just how it was, and I was like, 30 million for the other guy if he's not going to be used doesn't make sense um and the 49ers friends they were like look man we're tired of the drama somebody take him <laughs> like that's all we care about right now and i was like all right you know like i'll take him but i don't want to pay him <laughs> yeah 
anyway, on to the newest tech, I guess, in the NFL with the um, caps, caps that some players are wearing. Yeah, so uh, I don't know if Jonathan Taylor's worn it in the regular season. I know he wore it in the preseason. Um, I don't know. This is actually kind of timely now because, like, we, we first outlined this in the preseason, but with the two a concussion the other day. Yeah. It's now a lot more relevant again. Um, so I know James Daniels of the Steelers, who's an offensive lineman, is wearing it. There seems to be very little backlash from former players about guys wearing it. And there's no so it says that hatred towards those who aren't wearing it. It says that a, last week Jonathan Taylor said that he won't wear it during the regular season games because he didn't get enough reps with it to see how it affects his play. In the game, hey man, I'm just reading they off the headline. Wear, I that's fine. They all wear the guardian caps in practice. That's like the labor union law, right now. Hey man. Oh. <laughs> all right. I guess I look forward to him wearing it four years from now when he finally gets twelve games worth of preseason reps. Um, that seems like a really stupid way of saying I'm not going to wear it. <laughs> But, you know, the one guy, I guess, the Steelers player who is wearing it, um, not so much about trend setting here. It's about safety. Yeah. Offensive linemen and guys in the trenches, normally not much for getting concussions. Most of their injuries are from the waist down. But, I mean, but, they also are the ones that are constantly, like, they get a lot more, I guess, like, smaller repetitive concussions that are a lot less symptomatic. I don't know. For me, like, I think that there's a lot of nothing in terms of players hating it. I think in 10 years, we'll see a lot more use of this. Uh, and again, it's not about trend setting, but the fact that there are one or two players willing to go out of their way to do it now mm -hmm. will set the table for others later. Yeah. Um, I think that we're looking at an NFL player population that. I mean, is I assume at some point it's right, going to be like a. Ingrained in this is how they grew up, this is how they played from youth all the way through. Yeah, yeah, but my thing is, right, like, you see how hockey does it, right? They kind of, like, just make a rule and grandfather it, right? Right. Like, at some point, that's going to happen with the Guardian Caps. It, unless the labor uh, players union fights it. Yeah, but, like... Hockey, hockey, they don't fight it because there's not enough profit on either side in the NHL to warrant anybody holding out over it. Yeah, yeah, but, like... Uh... Okay, at some point, like, you know, so many studies keep coming out about, like, how NFL players, like, they just are, like, suffering in their retirement, basically. At yeah, some point, a level of somebody's going to get it. it. Huh? Yeah, I do think that there's a level, level of stubbornness to it, too. Yeah, yeah, but, like, at I some point, that... I, I'm not saying, I'm not saying yeah. two years from now, five years from now, even. I'm saying, you know... Somewhere in the I future. Think that if the if the players union fought this hard for safety, then they have to go all in on it at some point. Because yeah. we went from an era where it was, oh, the league doesn't believe CTE is real. They don't believe that concussion injuries can do this. It can't exist. To it's. You know, now we're in the age of neurological specialists are in the enough stadium. retired players have um, like, donated their brain to research. And so I do think that it's kind of a catch 22. 
because the players, I think, and especially stud players, want to believe that they're so good at what they do that they will never be in a position to be concussed. Yeah, but we know that's not the case. Right. The History has told us that, that that's not the case, the but they're just being that, young but, idiots. The fans know that, but good luck telling Lamar Jackson that he can't juke out of every hit. He, you know, it takes a certain level of confidence to be where he is. Mm -hmm. um, and it takes a certain amount of humbleness and humility to wear a guardian cap in a public setting, especially on a Sunday when the whole world is watching. And it does take trendsetters like James Daniels to do that for guys to be like, I know we wear this in practice, but it, I, you know, if it can save, I, I have a wife, I have a child, and if this can buy me another 15 years of being coherent after my playing days are over, then absolutely. Yeah. You know, it takes some family but men to do That's this. why I'm saying, like, it's it's probably more so going to be, like, you know, rolled out as, like, a kind of grandfathered in rule than anything else. I agree with that. Because, like, I, I then think... you don't deal with the ego of, like, Lamar Jackson or anybody else. I do think that, unfortunately, human beings, we learn through failure. And it may not be our own failure, but when we see on TV an injury like Tua's mm -hmm. where a, a, another concussion happens and he's on the ground making the hand movements, which I guess those hand movements are, um, they coincide with deeper rooted concussions. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like the third or fourth time it's happened to him that at some point there should be players who are like if it happened to him it, I have a way of creating some extra protection for or him. it's not no even like that these guys it, won't get concussions with guarding cap no no but like it's it's not even like I have a way of like guaranteeing. It's not guaranteed that you won't get a concussion, even with a guardian cap, right? But it's something that can potentially make a difference. It's yeah. like nothing. Nothing is going to be a surefire. Like you won't get a concussion, right? But it's it's all about like how can I minimize the possibility of me getting a concussion. And even if that guardian cap is like one or two percent, like why the heck not? Yeah, like you're also looking at a sport where like people more look at your numbers than your face. Mm -hmm. Like, especially if you're in the trenches, if you're an offensive lineman, you know who who cares how much they cut to your face, you know. Yeah, like, most of the time, like, especially also on defensive, like, linemen, when you're rushing the passer, everybody's just looking at your numbers and who the heck you are. Yeah, and I do think, like, maybe it comes down to marketing. I do think that, like, maybe if the NFL had sponsorships with, you know, healthcare um, companies, or even if teams regionally did, to promote promote health through there and mental health and stuff like that, then maybe you would get some more participation. But like it's it's an ingrained society of having to be the hardest hitter, having to be the toughest guy that it's hard to get these guys to say, hey, I can be wrong. Let me be humble in hey let me think about these guys are so taught to chase after the money and take care of their families in the climb that once they have reached the mountaintop they're no longer worried about what comes next yeah, yeah but like too many of these guys have lost everything taking care of their family in the climb 
Yes. Like, that's a whole nother problem. Like, financial illiteracy in, like, sports is ridiculous. I understand that. I'm more just saying, like, you get married, you, you have the climb, and you meet a beautiful woman, you marry them, you have a child, and it's all part of the climb. And then you're a 10 year NFL player with a wife and children who have everything that you ever wanted. Mm hmm. And you don't look towards what the next 30 years look like. Yeah. Why? Like, why would you, like, it they're not has taught to be that. Based on focus. Correct. But it's also like, it's also like, okay, I've worked all my life to get to this point. I'm here. I want to enjoy it. Right. It's not about like, you know, like once you get there, it's hard to transition. Just like, okay, how do I make this, you know, like, I, okay, 30 years from now, 40 years from now, right? Like, I know it's not going to last that long, but I still need to be here. Nobody's thinking like that. Or at least not most of them just, aren't thinking like that. I, you know, my thing is just how many Tua's, how many DeMar Hamlin's have to happen before people are like... I mean, how many times did it have to happen before the NFL actually, like, you know, said, okay, maybe something is is wrong? It took decades yeah it can take another few decades and there's nothing we can say about it it took the nfl long enough just to the acknowledge that there is, was a problem the thing is this is in the players hands yeah yeah the NFL, but... admittedly for all the shit that they do wrong has tried to make the game way more safe you can argue that you know there's bullshit flags thrown way more every game but like, it's be it, it's proven, like the roughing the passer rules that change. Has it not proven to make tackling different? Mm -hmm. Is it you know the dynamic kickoff, which we'll jump into in a second? Like, has it not proved like that? arrangement is it not with the intention of player safety it's now in the hands of the players to actually give a damn about the shit but then that like the, see, the only reason for them fought. the the only reason that like i'm saying like i it's gonna take another quite a bit of time it's not because like you, you have players that agree with you right but you also have players that's like i've been doing this for 10 years right so you you aren't going to appeal to all the players and then they have to do a vote and all this crap, right? Like, it's going to take time. And, I mean, it it took, like, decades for the NFL to, to fuss up a little bit. So, like, like if we have to wait another decade, that's, that's just how it's going to happen, right? I mean, I don't want to, but, like, whatever. Like, yeah, if I, you're I, a player who thinks... Happen, like, if you're a player who... to be at the college level. No, no, but like college and NFL are completely different, right? No, no I mean, if guardian caps are mandatory in game at the college level, like a crash course on wearing them, like guys need to be in the spotlight with it, not with a. Uh, but hey, like that, that, the only that. way that's going to happen is like they start normalizing it and kind of formalizing it as players that come in have to wear it. Right, which would be but a lot. The other thing is like. If you're a player who thinks like, you know, like, okay, well, I, I want to be able to enjoy like after I play football, right? Then you should wear it. Like, screw it, right? But like, again, a lot of these players have egos. They aren't going to change a thing. So the best thing that, that can happen is you can wait for these players to leave. Like, and there's nothing we can do about it. it regardless if we sit here and talk all day about it. With that is that there's always a player coming in who was taught the same thing. Yeah, yeah, but like that's most how football the, is. Everybody but the point is, is socioeconomically is but of the same. The background. point is right. Like most of the players coming in, know they aren't going to get a twenty-year-long career, right? But you can still appeal to more players coming in than are currently in the NFL. So at some point, you will get the advantage, right? But it that's only if you persuade yeah, yeah but like i mean it's gonna happen right at some point it has to happen 
And, like, regardless, like, they want to keep bashing their heads together, like, there's nothing I can do about it. NFL is so, cool. it's not the NHL where everybody, like, sees a skate slash in their, like, neck guards. Like, it, it's not the AHL where it's, like, they made things mandatory. Like, as long as it's optional... It's going to be, like, 99 No, no, but, like, it, the same thing happened, like... Okay, like, helmets, like... Those things... Yeah, that was a visor. The visors. Like, all those things are incremental, about, right? Like, the whole fucking brain. Yeah, but, like, everything's incremental, so at some point it will change, but, like, I'm not going to sit here and argue about how fast it has to happen, because, like, at the end of the day, they have the choice to wear it if they want. Let's let's start to move on here, but let's first take a second. Uh, thoughts on the Tua situation? I mean, it sucks. I'm of, I'm of the opinion now that like it sucks. He obviously has brothers who who play football uh, at the very least at the college level. Um, there's definitely family involvement. I don't know how can allow him comfortably to keep going out on the field and doing that to his body. I think it's a mindset situation, right? It's a mindset situation, but like once you learn about concussions and what the symptoms of more severe ones are, and to realize like if I'm a mother of him that three of them are now attached to this, and that's not to assume anything happened at the college or high school or whatever prior level mm -hmm. like there's definitely br uh brain trauma on top of that i was like i i was telling friends jokingly but like half serious like this guy's gonna be in a nursing home soon yeah he, he he's very close to being like he, he could be one hit away from being like paralyzed um and like half of a person uh -huh. and like if if i was in his circle i would be like there's no way you can come back at the very least this season you you have to take you have to step away from the game and reflect because yeah but like you have to be real with yourself he yeah, but the thing is, right, is he going to listen, right? Like, the point is, at the end of the day, it, is he going to listen? He has guaranteed money on a new deal that's like 100 plus million. Okay. He doesn't need the money anymore. Mm -hmm. The Dolphins have drafted offensive linemen early in the past five years. I can't speak to how well they've panned out, but he keeps getting hit a lot. Mm -hmm. Granted, this latest concussion, he was scrambling, but the hit from DeMar Hamlin did not look like it was very hard. No. It did not look dirty. It, his head just kind of fell in DeMar Hamlin's arm, mm -hmm. and then it bent back, mm -hmm. and that was how it looked. So, God help him if he actually gets hit hard. Yeah. And knowing the NFL, it will happen. Mm -hmm. So I'm of the mindset this guy is going to die young if he doesn't at least I mean, do something like, different. With the way, especially, like, even, like, even if he survives, which hopefully he does, it's like, you know, well into his later years, there is going to be consequences already with how bad it looked just then again that hit wasn't didn't look overtly malicious or anything no it, and you know people the, will say like if he had learned how to slide it could have been prevented i'd argue the way that he's been getting concussions in his career it eventually I'm, was going to happen this way but like i'm also pretty sure like each concussion is making it harder like it's it like the next one is coming a lot easier on a lot like an easier ish type of hit. You play the you play the one position where everybody's trying to to hurt knock you. you. 
Mm-hmm. But there's also yeah, so many rules team, around the but... safety of that position, right? Nowadays. And yet, and yet, didn't stop him from getting two other concussions. Yeah, I know. I know. I I agree. I'm just saying, like you know. But the the point is that like this one didn't look like overtly malicious or you know bad in a sense but like obviously it affected him a lot yeah and like something he has to do something and hopefully one of that is take time yeah i i can't justify him stepping on a practice field within a month Eh, we'll see all right anyway on to let's talk about dynamic kickoff as we mentioned it I just think it would be selfish to like disregard anybody else's opinions on it. Yeah, but you know, they have egos. They gotta get through it. Yep. Anyway, dynamic kickoff. Yeah, uh, we gotta find the rules on this because, like, I'll be honest. So still... you have to land the ball in between the twenty and the zero, and if it goes through, it's a normal touchback, right? But if you right takes it to the 25 or no 20. not a normal touchback it oh, does take it to the 20 i think it's the 20 because i think if you land in the uh, uh touchdown if you land in the zone or you fly over it takes you to the 30 mm-hmm. and then um if you you kick it out of bounds you go to the 30 regardless or something like that Kick out of bounds, you go to the 40. 40. I think, which was what it always was. Mm-hmm. Um, and onside kicks are only allowed in the fourth. Yes. The 10 players must line up across the return team's 40 yard line and must be stationary. So they must be each, you know, within a certain number of yards this time instead of all being. Mm-hmm. In one fluid motion against each other. Yep. At least seven players on the return team's thirty-five yard line. Two players. Two players in the return zone, which 30, is the twenty to the zero. To the goal line. Yeah. No more than two players in the landing zone. Um, players cannot move until the ball is received by the return man or hits the ground. Kickoff must make at least to the twenty-yard line, and the ball must be returned if it lands. Between the 20 and the goal line. If the ball lands in the end zone, it's to the 30-yard line. If the ball hits the in the landing zone but rolls into the end zone, it's to the 20. Yep. Uh, if the kickoff goes out of bounds or does not make it to the 20, I guess if you have a hurricane going on, then you start at the 40. Mm-hmm. So, this rule is brought in to encourage more returns while limiting injury. Very I mean, did you see the intention. did you see the I think it was the Chiefs kicker? I I forget who. There was a kicker who did like a a weird kick where it kind of like went straight and then kind of like veered off. No, I can't say that I saw that. I don't know, it was in a preseason game. I just saw a highlight passing in passing and it looked weird, but it looked like it was pretty consistent. And it would land like it, it. It made it hard for the returner to catch because, like, at the while it was already in its like peak, it started to just go off to one side, depending on how he kicked it. And what was the result of it, though? Like at at one time, it uh, landed in the zone, and then it went into the end zone. Uh, the other time, they didn't catch it, and the same thing happened. And like one time, they caught it kind of off balance. I think. So I, I will agree that it, this c- allows for some more creativity. I know that the Steelers. I, mean, I just think that like kickers are gonna find a way to m- make it like you know net twenty yard line basically. Sure. Um, and I know that uh, that teams have. I know the Steelers toyed with the idea of bringing in Cordell Patterson to the team because of. A guy like him was brought into the NFL as a first-round pick because of his return skills. Mm -hmm. And now that the league is trying to encourage more returns, um, 
I don't know. I do feel like the the data is saying that nothing is really changing. Yeah, but I mean, I think it's really just kicker is going to get used to it, and they're going to start. You're going to get pinned back into the twenty a lot more. Yeah, and, and I do think that even situationally, that some teams are just going to be okay with giving up the thirty. Yeah, I mean it, dude. If I if I'm a like thirty five zero, like who gives a crap? Touch- yeah, if you're up three touchdowns, like who gives a crap? Bro? My defense is obviously stopping you. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I I do think that the intent is very good. This I mean, this I think lifted. I the only thing I have a problem with is the fact that offside uh, onside kicks are only allowed in the fourth. Right. If you're down three scores and you're trying to make a comeback. You need that opportunity. Even um, then, it's like, you know, sometimes it was like a niche scenario where you, like, the team wanted to just try an onside kick in the, you know, last part of the second quarter. Also, the need to declare an onside kick. So. Well, because of the lineup change in the rules, that's why. That, yeah, but if everybody is 30 yards away anyway because of how you have to line up mm-hmm. because both teams basically are within 20 yards of yeah. the turf, then it would just be the, it would just be the kick kicking team no 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 but i'm saying it's like because of so how they changed they the declare it like obviously the other team would notice that everybody is 60 yards away yeah, no, but like the way that they line up, like because of how that changes, that you if you don't declare it, then everybody's gonna scramble to get up there. I would argue that that's on coaches and players for not realizing that there's a whole sea of other colored jerseys standing in a literal line. <laughs> But even the nobody uh, noticed at that point, you deserve to lose. Doesn't the, game. the place the ball gets kicked off from change also? No, you, you kick from the from the thirty-five, I think, or not uh, twenty-five. Yeah, but don't like I thought all kickoffs are the same unless there's a penalty beforehand. Yeah. Okay. Fair. So, and how an onside works is obviously you have the kicker in the middle, just like any kickoff, you got uh, five to the left and five to the right. Yep. They're all on the same yard line on an onside kick. If you are the other team, you have zero coaches who can get a player's attention and be like, that seems off. We need to go people anyway like my point is to not have the ball but like my point is that like i just think that rule is unnecessary like okay there's niche scenarios where you'd want it outside of the fourth quarter already right i'll I'll meet you in the middle here in the second and third quarter you should have to declare it in the fourth quarter it's it should be implied this is only happening because I'm dead. <laughs> but like, if I want to do a fucking onside kick with seven minutes left in the second quarter, I don't feel the need to tell the world. Mm-hmm. It, at that point, if I'm down 35 nothing, and there's still that much game left, okay, we've been outcoached. God forbid they get outcoached on a play. Yeah. <laughs> Like, they obviously came so prepared to whoop our asses. It should be easy for them to line up 10 yards away. Yeah. Um, I don't know. This this whole rule was adopted from the new XFL turned UFL. Um, again, I commend the NFL for trying to bring something back in the fold. My question is just, at this point, like, if the data continues to show that Everybody just wants the touchbacks. What what do you try next? Or do you just go back to the other style? Or do you just stick with this? 
Because touchbacks are touchbacks, and who cares the format? Mm-hmm. I I really think they should reconsider the onside kick rule. That's about it. Yeah. Like I could care less what the rest of the kickoff is doing. Like, like sure, ban onside kicks in the first. I agree. It's like who the hell is going to do it? But like the rest of the game, like come on. Yeah. Even the but third, I mean, like I don't think I've seen an onside kick in the third quarter. Even, even, but like, even in terms of broadcasting, like, there's a certain energy brought to an opportunity to say there's an outside kick. Mm-hmm. And you take that away and make it mundane. Yeah. Then it loses its appeal. Yep. Okay. Um, you want to talk about the ch- with, Yeah, let's wrap up with that. We don't have to yeah. go into. You want to talk about the Chiefs? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I guess we have a minute. Um, the team that everybody in the media says has a target on their back, despite the fact that they won back-to-back rings, people are now saying, like, hey, everybody thinks that they can't do it. And yeah. It's like, well, they did do it twice, but even Brady never three-peated. Um... It's hard to win. Mm -hmm. It's hard to win championships. It's hard to win back-to-backs. You know, I was Mm -hmm. lucky enough to see the Penguins do it. Um, But if there's ever a team that seems to keep defying the fact that, like, they got rid of Tyreek Hill, they got rid of all the other receivers, Mm -hmm. they brought in scrubs off the street, it it all really comes down to Mahal. Yep. Um, and even without Mahomes in the one or two spots along the past few years where he's been hurt, it didn't stop them from winning. I, I, they're not obviously Super Bowl ceiling, but um, yeah. yeah, I don't know. I think that they're more than capable. I think that the bulletin board material is a bit misguided because obviously they've shown time and time again that they can do it they can do it they can make it work but the thing is right like you were saying right they can make bad or suboptimal situations work work, and that says a lot to as like a team right they they've been drafting defensive heavy yeah overall in the past five six years because i think they were the first ones to really realize it like Mahomes can get the squeeze the best out of anybody. Mm-hmm. Like as long as they have Travis Kelsey and they have maybe one competent wide receiver, one like, like wide receiver he can just what go they to. Can. Yeah, but I I do think the media spotlight is this is very Golden State Warriors. Yeah, the first time you won one, it was like well. The Golden State Warriors haven't won one in a very long time. The second time, it's like, all right, they're 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 on to something here. We're now at the point, whether it be due to personal matters, um, and just them being in the spotlight, whether it be Patrick Mahomes' brother, or wife, whether it be Travis Kelsey's girlfriend, whatever it may be. We're, we're being treated with the, oh, they're so good on the field, and the, oh, we can't let them go off the field, mm-hmm. which is making it very rapidly hard to to swallow this as acceptable, um, just in terms of coverage, not in terms of play style. Like, I, I think with the Golden State Warriors, their run – between 2013 and 2018, it was like, well, they keep taking down LeBron. It's obviously easier to root for the guy taking down LeBron yeah. because they built this team. The Chiefs have built their team. Oh, yeah. And they hadn't won a Super Bowl in a very, very long time, if not ever. Um, and were known as Andy Reid couldn't win the big one and the Chiefs couldn't win the big one. To now it's like, I, I can't turn on the TV without, like, 
Like, there's still 31 other teams. Yeah. But I, Again, I mean, even Steelers fans are like, well, if the Steelers don't win today, at least the Chiefs won. Okay. Well, the Chiefs are going to get their dose of, of entertainment value out to the world, whether they win or lose. Don't yeah. you fucking worry about it. Um, so, like, it's now become easier. I can't speak for other diehard sports fans who live and die by their singular teams, but it's starting to get annoying. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, it's not, it wasn't enough when you have the first takes and Skip and Shins, mm -hmm. all these other talk shows who talk about the Dallas Cowboys nonstop. Talk about the Steelers nonstop. Talk about, you know, the same five teams over and over again. There's talk about LeBron and KD and, you know, the same 20 players over and over again. It's getting to the point where this isn't just one talk show that I can avoid. This is every time you clock into any NFL game. Yep, I just turn off. I just turn off sound at that point. It, it, it's, I got Sam being like, Oh, she's making notes when I do my fantasy football draft. Travis Kelsey is the only thing that you have to do. It's like, Sam doesn't know shit about fantasy football. Like, it's it's all just becoming too much. And part of it is that musician that I refuse to fucking name. <laughs> but, like, this is, like, at some point, gave hey, people like, privacy. I, mean, I know they're not asking for it. I'm asking you to give those people privacy. I mean, like, again, I just, like, kind of turn off the sound. Oh, dude, I wish I could do that. Yeah, just leave it on I in the background. Too much of an, I have too much of an appreciation for broadcasters. Okay, because half the broadcasters whoa, 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 nowadays whoa. are... Okay, no, no, no. In terms of, like, play-by-play -play guys who... You know how hard it is to get into that industry, and so what if like my when, point well, is? No, stop. Let me finish. When they hit their pinnacle and they hit the top of their game, and they're doing NFL games, they deserve to have their voices heard. The yeah, but is the problem? But again, like I, I agree with you, right? That they, they did a great job to get where they are, but I ain't listening to that yapping. And that's at the end of the day, I would have to listen to it. <laughs> right. But look, no, I don't want, I, I, I will not, I won't mute for an hour because of what was said for a minute. No, but like, it's not even a minute, right? It, it just keeps coming back. It's like, oh, hey, this play happened. It is and, a boomerang effect. Yeah. And I, Again, I won't mute. I, I, I'm like you. I'm not muting because it's, you know, one time, one minute, something was said, right? It's every couple of plays, it just somehow comes back and forth and goes away, then comes back. Exhausting. It's exhausting. It, it, you know, it very much resembled Tom Brady's career, where it was like, when it came time to the playoffs, it, you might as well just not have talked about anybody other than the Patriots. Yeah, but I mean, like, yeah, like... The offseason, all you could so, talk about was, but, well, who can beat the Patriots? But this isn't even sports. It just is kind of attached to but the like, hips. My point is that, okay, like, they even... The play-by-play -play guy, the color broad... The, the, the broadcasters, right? They're, they're getting paid. It doesn't matter. But, like, I, I don't have to put my ears through it. <laughs> anyway... I let's, wish I could do that to myself. Let's move on, right? Okay. We had the NFL in Brazil. Yeah. So that that turned into, like, a nasty rumor of, oh, we're sending two teams that wear green, and the whole world thought that they were just both going to wear white uniforms because there was an actual belief that wearing green in Brazil was too gang-affiliated that was going to lead to rushes on the field or something. <laughs> um, yeah, that didn't happen that way. Yeah, also, good. it's really hard to play a, a football game when everybody's wearing the same uniform. Um, 
I watched. I thought the game for its entertainment value was very good. Mm -hmm. Um, They did do the one weird thing that I don't know if you noticed, but like when they put the games in London, stuff like that, they treated like a Super Bowl and they put one of the end zones as one team, one of the end zones as the other. They put the NFL in the middle. Yep. Um, They put the NFL in the middle, but they treated the Eagles like the home team. Yeah, because... both end zones were Eagles. It uh, was their home the... game, though, right? It doesn't matter, though. Like the NFL is trying to promote the NFL, yeah, and both entities. I did think that that was a little bit weird. Um, although, to their credit, the in-stadium broadcaster, uh, PA guy, was doing a hell of a job of hyping up everything. Yeah, but. Um, that very well could also just be because obviously no NFL game has been there before. Um, They played in a smaller stadium, like a 50,000 stadium, soccer stadium, which is a bit polar opposite to the Wembley stadiums and other London ones that were at least, I want to say, double that. But the the sound factor on the broadcast was very good, it, mm-hmm. it, and the atmosphere appeared to be very alive. Yeah. So, I'm not opposed to that becoming a yearly thing. I just think that at some point you have to you have to start sending different teams each year. Mm-hmm. You can't send the the Jaguars of the world um, every year because if this is going to screw with teams' home games. It should be on equal footing. Yeah. Everybody should lose one at some point. It shouldn't be, oh, the Jaguars play six home games and then they play the other two in London. Yeah. What are you going to do at this point? Like, I mean, there's also, like, teams, like, which team is going to, you know, like, if if you take away a, uh, like, Eagles home game, which they did, right? You lose the people who are coming to the Eagles game, but you gain all the people who are going to the Brazilian game, right? Right. But if you take away a Jaguars game, that number, you're losing less and gaining a lot more. Although I do guess now that I think about with the week 17 or 18 implant um, being implemented into the fold, like, there is always half the teams have one more home game than the others Mm -hmm. because you have been on. But like, I think that at the very least, and if you're going to do it that way, um, yeah, whoever it has to be two teams that have, it it should be two teams with uh, nine home games playing each other Mm -hmm. or whatever. Because eight home games, nine versus eight. Right. So it should be, Two teams yeah. with eight okay, home games eight playing each other in neutral, I feel. Yeah. Yes, if you have the plus one margin for home games, one of those two of those teams should be playing neutral. Because at the very least, you're selling as many home games as... The rest of the league, basically. Right, exactly. Okay. I think that's the criteria going forward. Okay. Uh, you want to do a week one? I know we're week two. We've already talked about Tua, but you want to do a week one recap? To end it out? Maybe like a 30-second one. I don't know. Like, scoring appears to be down um, overall. But, you know, there definitely appear to be some high-power offenses still. Um, It's hard to think that the same teams won't still dominate. Yeah. You know, you look for more from teams like Tampa and Detroit because they obviously showed flashes. Mm-hmm. Um, but we also don't know consistency. I mean, we'll find out those, tomorrow yeah. at least for we'll a little bit. Out. But I think overall, each each conference, AFC and NFC, probably has two teams that are perennial studs. Mm-hmm. I do think that there's four or five teams in each conference that could be in that second tier. Okay, fair. And that 
much like when we talked about the wild card uh, for baseball, like when we talked about in July, is like I think we could see a lot of teams towards the end of the year that could be like ninth in the AFC or NFC, where mm-hmm. they could, with a win, be like the third seed. Yeah. But we'll find out what that is as time unfolds. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for tuning in, and we'll catch you next time.